Well, you know, between the volcano erupting in Iceland, earthquakes in both Haiti and Chile, the tsunami that almost threatened Hawaii, all happening in 2010, it seems that the world is slowly falling apart, doesn't it? In a previous work, Apocalypse 2012, Lawrence Joseph, a journalist, science consultant, he evaluated the likelihood of a planet-wide catastrophe in the year 2012 by presenting scientific evidence of chaos, looming chaos, and mass extinction. Now, with the recent alarming frequency of natural disasters and man-made, apocalypse doesn't seem that far-fetched. His new work is called Aftermath, and Lawrence Joseph is next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Journalist and science consultant Lawrence Joseph has written about science, nature, religion for various publications, including the New York Times, author of several books, his research on the Science and Mythology of Apocalypse 2012 during the past several years has led him to work with scientists, shamans, philosophers on five continents. Here he is tonight, full program now on Coast to Coast AM. Lawrence, welcome back. How are you? Very well, and very glad to be back, George. Good. Lots ha- a lot of things going on on this planet right now. You know, I was looking at, at, at your book, Aftermath, and then trying to tie it into these events that have been going on, and there's way too many. I know, and it's it's um, it seems like there's a crescendo of catastrophes that is that is is according to some musical score that I can't quite fathom. But I think all of us can, if not hear it, sense it. There's it's it's in the air, and we're we're past the point where it's simply oh the media is covering it more. It's not you know we. <laughs> hmm. We're, we're beyond the point where it's you shoot the messenger. Um, and we're learning things that, that we had feared. Um, the communication of earthquakes, for example, the one in Chile that several minutes later, there were a couple hundred microquakes struck Yellowstone. I mean, that's, that's a, a seismic nightmare. Oh, yeah, and we've got that caldera there in Yellowstone. If that sucker goes, we're in trouble. In trouble, and the northern hemisphere would have its uh, atmosphere would have the sun blocked out for a couple of growing seasons, and uh, you know famine and and all and breathing. <laughs> you t- you talk about almost like a triangular shoot here, of political, economic, and natural forces, which are headed for what you call a deadly convergence. It certainly seems so. Um, and this is where I reach the point where I, I, I have to confess that, that what I feel and what I, I, I think rationally diverge. I feel that we are headed towards this deadly convergence. I've felt it for a while now. Uh, I've been working on on a study of 2000. I've been studying 2012 since late 2004. I've written two books. It's been f- five, six years. I've given 500 interviews on the subject. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, but it's it, it apocalypse in the sense of of radical jarring violent change that alters our daily life permanently or indefinitely is an unprovable hypothesis. Um, one can one can circumstantially argue it, and one can um, be eloquent in in one's conviction about it, but you can't prove it. And um, this is this is a personal struggle of mine because I really like to to lay down the facts. You know, I mean, I, I love writing about religion and I love working with shamans and I've learned a lot and I've I've I, I like to think that I've expanded my horizons by this. But you know, f- first and last, I'm a science guy. <laughs> yeah, you, and you you've been that for a long time. I have. I've been writing about science for 25 years. I've been chairman of an advanced plasma physics research company for several years and been in, involved with them for 15 years. Um, so that's that's my comfort zone. So I suppose uh, this evening I'd like to start with the one looming catastrophe that is scientifically provable that seems to be heading our way rapidly and that we can do something about. And we're probably not doing anything about right now, are we? No, you know what I've got? I'm going to start this program off with some good news, if you don't mind. That would be nice. <laughs> okay. Um, last time I was on the show, I talked uh, a fair bit about solar storms, sunspots, which are storms on the sun, which emit um, coronal mass ejections, basically explosions that emanate from the sun and sometimes hit the Earth. And I think we were just coming out of some sun activity 
going into this solar minimum where sunspots just died off for a while, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's the deepest minimum in a century at least. Um, but what we've been looking at um, in, in the second book, Aftermath, I really examined quite closely is, is what effect these solar storms can have when they hit the Earth. And uh, in the first book, that I surveyed it, but life changed for me, and I really don't mean to be so dramatic, but my life changed in December 2008 when the National Academy of Sciences issued its landmark study um, reporting that the electrical power grid, which supplies basically all the electricity we have to homes and businesses and anywhere else. Throughout the country? Throughout the country, and, and there are grids throughout the world. Um, that, that power grid is gravely threatened by solar blasts. According to the National Academy of Sciences, not, you know, not Larry Joseph, but uh, the, this closest thing we have to is Supreme Court of Scientific Opinion in the United States, and really for much of the rest of the world, up to 130 million Americans could be without electricity for months or years if we are hit by a solar blast the size of ones that we've got that we have been hit by in 1859, 1921, and perhaps several others. Well, we know it's going to happen eventually, Lawrence. Yes, we do, and we also know that the next climax of, of solar storms is in late 2012. Um, that's by scientific consensus. There's really not much argument, perhaps early 2013, but, you know, the, the date 2012, maybe coincidentally with the, the ancient mind prophecy, stands as, as the next red zone for being hit by these things. And just let's consider for a moment what it would be like, God forbid, to be without electricity for months or years. I mean, it's not just no telecom, not just we can't listen to your show or to call each other on the phone, but no water or gasoline in most cases because the pumps are electric. No no ATMs, nothing. That's right. No Re cell phones. Refrigeration, uh, basic fresh food and medicine, law enforcement, military security would be severely compromised. And this is something that, that is, again, it's the National Academy of Sciences issued a, a major report on this um, and warns that... Um, I haven't heard the good news yet, Lawrence. Oh, I'm going to get there. <laughs> You're going to be, it's more shocking than any catastrophe. Um, I've been talking about this now for several years, and, you know, I mean, sometimes have been dismissed politely or not so politely. Um, but then when the National Academy of Sciences came out with its report, people began to listen more. And astonishingly, last month, the United States House of Representatives voted unanimously to authorize the protection of the power grid from solar blasts. I mean, when's the last time those folks were unanimous about anything? Well, that's true. They that's true. They bicker about everything. Bicker, they won't cross the aisle to give, perform the Heimlich maneuver. I mean, these, these folks are so poisonously partisan. And for them to come together, I think the vote was 437 to nothing, um, to, to say this is a serious problem. Now, now, and when you say pass legislation, what are they supposed to do? Okay. You know, I've been writing for 25 years, and I never thought my life's work would add up to surge suppressors. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not sexy. but Isn't he from Russia? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you're sorry. <laughs> um, but just the way we protect our computers and our plasma TVs by plugging them into surge suppressors to protect against electric power surges, so, too, do we need to protect our power grid. And it comes down to, and I've done a ton of work on this, uh, a lot of it is in aftermath, um, we need about 350 washing machine-sized surge suppressors distributed around the power grid. And if we do that, and that should cost several hundred million, not several hundred billion, not AIG bailout money, but several hundred million dollars, we can basically protect our electricity supply, which is the cornerstone technology. But that's no money. No. And so for a long time it was being dismissed as either just, you know, idle doomsday speculation, or then the next phase of the debate um, was that it's, oh, it's intrusive government regulation uh, on the utility industry. And there's still a fair bit of arguing about that. But when seen in terms of national security, which is certainly what it is, um, it, it, it passed miraculously in the House. What about the Senate? That's, that, the Senate bill 
comes up 